So uh, first, I'd like to thank Timo and the other organizers for um, putting together this exciting workshop. So today, I'd like to talk about some recent work on the circuit mechanism for uh, global ignition. Um, so this was very much inspired by uh, Peter's work that he just talked about. So this is really a perfect time for me to describe this. Uh, in particular, his work was mostly done in primates and ours is in mice. So hopefully that fits the theme of this meeting. So global ignition is a brain process closely associated with conscious perception. Um, in daily life, we're constantly bombarded by many sensory stimuli from all these modalities, but most of them do not reach our conscious awareness. So for example, in the auditory system, most of the time we're not aware of the background noise in our environment, and in the visual system, we may not see what's right in front of us if we're not paying attention. But the fact that these uh, sensory stimuli are not consciously perceived does not mean that the signals fail to reach our nervous system. Uh, for the visual system, as Peter just described, uh, even the unperceived stimuli can evoke uh, strong responses in the primary visual cortex. So what determines conscious perception? Uh, according to the global uh, workspace theory, uh, so if I'm uh, explaining it wrong, Stan, please correct me. Um, so conscious perception requires propagation of the signal from sensory cortex to parietal and prefrontal areas. And these are parts of the global neuronal workspace. So once the global workspace is activated, it amplifies the signal through recurrent excitation. And this kind of explosive activation of a large brain network is called global ignition and is thought to underlie conscious perception. And if the signal only activates the sensory cortex but fails, to ignite the global workspace, then the signal would die down quickly and the stimulus would remain uh, subliminal. And as a direct test of this, so I'm showing Peter's data, uh, you can see that even in the mistrials when the monkey failed to detect that stimulus, uh, V1 neurons still show pretty robust responses. But in the prefrontal cortex, the responses during the mistrials uh, are much, uh, much lower than uh, in the HIT trials. So now the question is, why does global ignition happen in some trials, but not others, even though the visual stimulus is exactly the same? So one potential explanation is the fluctuating level of arousal and attention. So if the monkey was more alert and attentive in some trials, then um, he's more likely to perceive the stimulus than if he's drowsy and inattentive. But whether and how uh, arousal regulates global ignition uh, are unclear. So that's uh, what we wanted to study in mice. Um, as a first step, uh, Bing Li and Chen Yan Ma, two postdocs in my lab, asked a very simple question. Does global ignition depend on sleep-wake brain states? So we know that the level of conscious awareness is greatly reduced during sleep. So what about global ignition? So we focus on the propagation of activity from the visual cortex to the rest of the brain, in particular the prefrontal cortex, or maybe we should say the frontal cortex, uh, because as Peter showed, uh, this propagation is important for uh, detection of the visual stimulus. So this is our experiment. Um, we activated uh, the visual cortex optogenetically after expressing a virus, expressing the opsin reacher. And to measure activity propagation to the rest of the brain, we use a functional ultrasound imaging, which measures changes in blood volume associated with neural activity. So it's kind of like functional MRI, but I think it's better for small rodents because the equipment is much cheaper, so individual labs like mine can actually afford it. Um, and the spatial resolution is really quite amazing. It's about 100 microns. So this is the volume of view of our experiment, and you can see that it's a large fraction of the mouse brain. So here is a particular sagittal view. Uh, in addition to the visual cortex, which was activated directly by a uh, laser, we also saw activation in the lateral geniculate nucleus, uh, which is part of the visual thalamus receiving direct excitatory projection from the visual cortex. Here is a 3D summary of the brain regions activated by our uh, optogenetic activation of V1. 
So um, you can see that in addition to V1, you see a little bit of a frontal region that's activated. Um, you also see a little bit of a contralateral activation. So basically, the activity propagates from the visual cortex to several cortical regions, including this frontal region, ACA. It also propagates to some subcortical regions, in particular the thalamus and superior colliculus. So um, in each recording session, uh, we also measured EEG and EMG, and that allowed us to uh, monitor the natural sleep-wake cycle of the mice. So here I'm showing you the um, uh, spectral power gram of the EEG, and here's an EMG trace. And this is the color-coded brain states of the mouse classified based on EEG and EMG. One thing I should say is that mice have very fragmented sleep, so they kind of flip in and out of the three brain states uh, every few minutes. So if we look at the cerebral blood volume signal, CBV signal, uh, averaged across multiple brain regions, in general, it's much higher during REM sleep, uh, these blue periods, compared to both uh, wakefulness and REM sleep. And this is consistent with published papers. So what about activity propagation from the visual cortex? Um, here are the responses in the visual cortex uh, during non-REM sleep and wakefulness. And you can see that the amplitudes are fairly similar between the two brain states. And this is not surprising because we're driving these neurons directly with laser. But as the activity propagates uh, to the frontal regions, there's a striking difference. In the uh, retrosplenial cortex uh, here, you can see that the response during non-REM sleep is only about 60% of the response uh, during wakefulness. And in the frontal region ACA, the non-REM response is only 30% of the wake response. So these are the cortical regions, but if we look at the subcortical regions, the thalamus and superior colliculus, the responses are again similar between wakefulness and non-REM sleep. So here's a summary of the difference between uh, wake and non-REM responses. Um, each dot is from a different mouse. Um, basically, uh, activity propagation from V1 is suppressed by non-REM sleep for cortical regions, but not for subcortical regions. And this suppression is particularly strong for this frontal region, ACA. So even though um, ultrasound imaging allowed us to measure uh, activity over large volume of the brain, including the subcortical regions, which is really fabulous, but what it measures is uh, changes in blood volume, which is only indirectly related to neural activity. So next we wanted to confirm this suppression of cortical propagation using calcium imaging. So here we injected one virus expressing Reacher into V1, and another virus expressing GCAM into both V1 and ACA, and we use fiber photometry for calcium imaging. So here are the ongoing activity uh, recorded from V1 and ACA uh, across different brain states. So you can see that uh, these neurons, so I, I should say that in this case, uh, GCAM is targeted to the pyramidal cells uh, in the cortex. So you can see that these cells are generally more active during wakefulness and REM sleep compared to non-REM sleep. And here's a population uh, summary. And here are the responses to uh, laser stimulation in V1. You can see that in V1, uh, the responses are quite similar between wakefulness and non-REM sleep, right? similar to what we saw with uh, ultrasound imaging. But in the ACA, there's a striking difference. Um, during wakefulness, V1 stimulation caused a general excitation of the ACA parameter neurons that lasted for a few seconds. But during non-REM sleep, there's a very small and transient excitation followed by prolonged uh, inhibition. So it seems that based on both ultrasound and calcium imaging, um, global ignition of the frontal cortex is much more likely to happen during wakefulness than non-REM sleep. I should say that uh, during REM sleep, the responses are actually quite similar to the responses uh, during wakefulness, but because REM sleep is quite rare uh, and the number of trials is low, so the measurements are kind of noisy, so that's why I didn't show the data. Okay, so now the question is, what causes this huge reduction of activity propagation during non-REM sleep? 
So one candidate mechanism that comes to mind is cholinergic modulation. Uh, acetylcholine is a neuromodulator uh, known to be important for arousal and attention. And here are some of our earlier studies of the basal forebrain cholinergic neurons. So first we know that they project massively to the cortex. Um, so here you can see that the cell bodies are sitting here in the basal forebrain, and you can see extensive axonal projections up to the cortex. And when we recorded from these cells, uh, here is just one example, but we recorded from a bunch, uh, we know that these cells are active during both wakefulness and REM sleep, but are almost completely shut down during non-REM sleep. So we wondered whether this huge reduction of cholinergic activity could contribute to this huge suppression of cortical activity propagation. We manipulated the basal forming cholinergic neurons chemogenetically uh, by expressing uh, either GQ for activation or GI for inactivation. And for the experiment, we recorded the propagation for two hours uh, before CNO injection and another two hours afterwards. So here's a result from ultrasound imaging. Um, so all the black lines are the ACA response um, uh, before a CNO injection, and the colored lines are after. So with GI inactivation of the cholinergic neurons, uh, we saw a strong reduction of the response in the ACA during wakefulness, so that now the response is as weak as during non-REM sleep. But with GQ activation, we saw a strong increase of the response during non-REM sleep, so that now activating V1 caused an activation of the frontal cortex almost as much as during uh, wakefulness. So here's a summary of the difference before and after CNO injection. Again, each dot is one mouse. Basically, activating the cholinergic neurons caused an increase in ACA response, and inactivation caused a decrease. So you notice that this decrease is much stronger during wakefulness than non-REM sleep. And we think this is because cholinergic neurons are already pretty much shut down completely during non-REM sleep. So this is really just a floor effect. And when we repeated the measurements with calcium imaging, we pretty much saw the same effects. So what's downstream of cholinergic modulation? We know that both excitatory and inhibitory cortical neurons are modulated by ACH through a variety of nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. And we thought that perhaps the inhibitory neurons play an important role in gating global ignition. And that's because with calcium imaging, we saw this very strong inhibition of the pyramidal neurons during non-REM sleep, but not during wakefulness. So we're very curious where this inhibition comes from. Previous work from many labs have shown that uh, PV, somatostatin, VIP, and NDNF, uh, label largely non-overlapping populations of cortical GABAergic neurons, and together they account for probably 80 to 90 percent of all the GABAergic neurons. So we wondered which of these subtypes contributes strongly to the inhibition during non-REM sleep. So we first did imaging from each sub, uh, uh, subtype uh, using the corresponding Cree mouse lines. So here you can see that uh, this is ongoing activity um, for VIP neurons. They're generally more active during both REM sleep and wakefulness than non-REM sleep. Somatostatin neurons are also similar, and the NF neurons are also similar. But the PV neurons seem to be more active during non-REM sleep compared to wakefulness. And here are the responses to V1 stimulation. So here I'm imaging everything in the ACA. Um, so the VIP neurons show a high baseline activity during wakefulness and also an excitation upon V1 stimulation. But during non-REM sleep, a lower baseline and no response. The somatostatin neurons are also excited during wakefulness, but are actually suppressed during non-REM sleep. So it seems like neither of these uh, is in the position to account for the inhibition of the pyramidal neurons, right? Because they just don't increase their activity. The NDNF neurons show a little bit of excitation during non-REM, but the amplitude is much smaller than during wakefulness. Only the PV neurons show a higher baseline activity, and also the excitation by V1 stimulation is comparable during non-REM sleep uh, and wakefulness. <laughs> 
So next, we uh, chemogenetically manipulated uh, the PV neurons. So activating these cells caused a decrease in the pyramidal neuron response uh, during wakefulness, and inactivating these cells caused an increase of pyramidal neuron activity because this prolonged inhibition seems to be reduced uh, by PV neuron inactivation. But when we manipulated ND and NF neurons, we didn't see too much of an effect. So it seems like it's the PV cells that contribute strongly to the inhibition of pyramidal neurons uh, during non-REM sleep. So just to put it all together, uh, we know that um, somatostatin VIP and NDNF neurons, which we showed to be more active during wakefulness, all of them preferentially target dendrites of pyramidal neurons. But the PV neurons, which are more active during non-REM sleep, they preferentially target the cell body. So it seems like during wakefulness, uh, most of the inhibition to pyramidal neurons uh, comes from the dendrite, but during non-REM sleep, it comes more from the soma-targeting PV neurons. We know that PV, uh, soma target, uh, somatic inhibition is particularly effective in shutting down the spiking output of the pyramidal neurons. So perhaps due to this very powerful somatic inhibition, the initial excitation uh, evoked by V1 stimulation is rapidly quenched by this inhibition. On the other hand, during wakefulness, this inhibition is reduced, and that allows uh, the recurrent excitation to kick in, which amplifies the signal and causes global ignition. And, fi uh, and finally, uh, just to put everything together, uh, we know that during wakefulness, uh, there's a high cholinergic activity, and that probably causes a higher activity of these three types of neurons. We know at least the VIP neurons express a high level of nicotinic AC receptors. And the PV neurons are probably inhibited by these cells because we know that SST and NDNF neurons provide powerful inhibition of the PV cells. But during non-REM sleep, these neurons are less active due to reduced cholinergic activity, and that perhaps caused the disinhibition of the PV neurons. So it seems like during both wakefulness and non-REM sleep, there is enough inhibition to allow EI balance, which is very important for cortical activity, but there is a shift between somatic uh, and dendritic inhibition. When somatic inhibition dominates, the initial excitation that comes from other cortical areas is quickly quenched. But when dendritic inhibition dominates, it allows recurrent excitation to amplify the signal and causes global ignition. So that's it. And finally, these are the two brilliant postdocs who did all the work. So I'm just here to talk about it. Thank you.